let's start off with some introductions. We've got some impressive people up here, um, me not being one of them. Um, so let's start with Pierre, because he actually cracks open chests and, and does real life-saving. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do every day and the different, you've, you're in a lot of different companies and you just joined a, a, a Venrock back company that you guys will all know about. Uh, they just changed their name from Consulting MD to Grand, Grand Rounds. Um, but you've got several companies behind you, so just do a quick introduction on your background. Sure. Thanks a lot, Missy, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to discuss this interesting technology with you. So I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon by training, which means largely I take care of cancers of the lung and the esophagus, do a little work on the transplantation service as well. And uh, in addition to that, I've really been intrigued by the process of allowing physicians to interact one with another in a web-based environment. So I founded one company called uh, Parnassus Medical Technology, which is based on connecting physicians in essentially a social network-like space where they can all contribute to uh, contributing, for example, diagnostic input and evaluating patients in web-based environments. And I've taken a position as a consultant with Grand Rounds Health, which essentially provides the best quality second opinions available uh, in web-based uh, in web-based settings. Excellent. Uh, a little modest, but <laughs> um, also has helped Doximity, one of the companies that we're invested in. Definitely somebody that is always being called upon for um, sort of the, the clinical perspective. So Ian, let's go to you. I've known you. I just want to say, I want to just give props to Ian. So, uh, you know, uh, Morgan Thaler Ventures has really strong ties to both Stanford Business School and Berkeley Haas. We run a lot of campus liaison programs there. And so Ian was like walking around in the GSB his first year and he always, always was attaching himself to like one or two or three different entrepreneurial projects. And we were like, where is he going to land? Where is he going to land? You know, and then all of a sudden he started walking around with a device. It wasn't Google Glass because it wasn't out yet. And I was like, that dude is crazy. There's just something going on with that guy. I, don't, I think he's out there. I'm not quite sure what he's up to. And I just think you were quite prescient because you really saw the trend before anyone else did. And you, you, you claimed it. And you really believed in the vision that there could be you know, an entirely new set of health apps that could be built on this platform. And I think the VC community was like, whatever. Uh, and now you've got VCs that are jumping in, right? You've got Palomar and Qualcomm Life that just did their glass on uh, glass omnics or something like that. Uh, and you've got you know um, Kleiner and several others, and Dreesen Horowitz getting into the game. So you know, kudos to you for for finding this very early on and getting into Rock Health. So tell us a little bit about your background before you you actually came to Augmentics. Oh, sure thing. Yes. Uh, thanks for the kind words, Missy. Uh, in fact, I've been thinking a lot about augmented reality in healthcare even before Glass. I used to work at Intuitive Surgical. Arguably, they're the leader in augmented reality in healthcare and have been for some time. And even long before that, I worked at Pixel Optics, which has been making electronic eyewear back in the early 2000s. So had an opportunity to try on Google Glass late last summer. I quite literally dropped everything and founded the company Augmetics, along with my co-founder who uh, left Stanford, left the medical school. And together, we formed the company that is Augmetics today. And our focus is really rehumanizing the doctor-patient interaction, first in the outpatient environment, uh, alleviating this most pressing problem in healthcare of doctors feeding the beast, feeding the EHR on the computer documenting, allowing sort of more humane care and also more efficiency. Excellent. All right. So now that you guys know us, a little bit about uh, Glass. Um, I want to I want to have just Ian do a quick kind of feature drive-through. But before we do that. Um, a lot of people talk about it as sort of an extension to your smartphone, augmented reality, the dashboard of life. You know, you've, you've been reading all the press on it. How many here have ever actually uh, worn a Google Glass device on their, on their head? I mean, this is a highly wow. adoptable audience. That's pretty impressive. That's amazing. I have an even better question. How many of you arrived on a date, an online date, and someone was wearing <laughs> one of these? That's, I just want to see one hand, because that has actually happened to me quite a bit lately. Anyone? No. All right. Well, you've got to come live in Mountain View. Uh, anyways, so, Ian, take us through just a couple of the features, and then we'll blow through this and get into the real panel here. Absolutely. Well, the dominant feature is this display. It's like a visual, a visual screen floating in the distance and focus, and when it's off, you can see right through it. But there's a lot of other non-obvious uh, features to glass. There's audio out. It works through mastoid vibration, so there's nothing actually going into my ear. What does that mean? It means I can actually wear a stethoscope at the same time. It has microphones, two of them. It has a camera. Um, you can touch it. You can speak to it. It also has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. And that's just the beginning. It's really an amazing device. It's super consumer grade. It's very durable, stretchy. You know, it's, it can take a beating. I'd say that's it in a nutshell. 
Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that, that's pretty interesting is is that because you've got uh, two microphones and a camera, and you can essentially, if any of you guys have used Google Now on your smartphones, it's got a very similar UI as Google Now uh, around search. So you can do a lot of, if you have the companion app on your phone, you can do a lot of the same things that you would do on your phone. You can SMS, you can search on, on Google Maps, you can do a lot of interesting things. So you're, you're doing it in real time uh, as you're actually walking. And the point of view is from your perspective, which is really interesting in the medical world. So let's actually jump right to that. Pierre, I know you have a couple slides for us. I kind of want to talk about the use cases sure. for healthcare. And we've got it broken up between enterprise and consumer. So you're going to tackle hospital. Absolutely. Thanks a lot again. I'm going to make a couple quick comments that are often referred to in, with respect to health IT and medicine in general, but particularly in surgery, which is a tendency to use this metaphor towards uh, a metaphor with flight training and pilots. I am not a pilot, so many of my comments about this derive from the fact that I think this metaphor is actually quite strained in medicine. But one thing that is clear is that both medicine and in a typical uh, in a typical plane is actually a technologically intense environment. However, at the same time that you have this great sort of technologic kind of chaos around the user, there is also a need to maintain a certain specific focus. Now for the pilot, for example, that might be a focus, for example, on the runway or keeping a horizon, a horizon awareness and things of that sort. So there's a need both to have the technologic input at the same time that focus is maintained. Now, this is a typical operating room environment. This is my room number nine at UCSF. And one thing you'll see is that this is also a fairly technologically rich environment. You'll often hear disparaging remarks about making your UI simple for physicians, and physicians aren't used to technology. It's not that we're not used to technology, it's that we're overwhelmed with it. So when you come to us with your next new technology, just understand that it, it overlaps on all of this that we're using on kind of a daily basis. Now when we add personnel, when we add human beings into this environment, of course the focus also should be pretty self-evident. That focus is the patient itself, and this is where we sort of turn to sort of think about how the Google Glass might actually interact with me in specific in the operating room. And so the advantage here in using the Google Glass, surprisingly, I'm going to make a little admission between just the 500 of us in the World Wide Web, which is that when, we, when I used this, this uh, glass the initial time, I actually thought it was going to be purely gimmick. I'd put it on, I would use it, be able to make a claim that I was a first to use it in a surgical setting, et cetera. But in truth, it actually became very functional for me. And this is, this is to say that what, it, what we did was we allowed ourselves to actually project CAT scan images while I was operating. So at the same time I was actually looking physically at the patient, doing a videoscopic, a minimally invasive procedure, I was seeing the actual CAT scan axial radiologic images in front of me at the same time. So if you, if you follow me, there was a sort of a cognitive integration between what I saw right in front of me and what I was actually seeing as, as far as the radiographs in an internal space with the patient. And that was extraordinarily helpful. So I will say that I actually kind of became a zealot by using it myself. And the, the advantage here is to really have that sort of real-time data available uh, to the clinician. So this differs a little bit from simply taking photographs or actually sharing what you're doing with others, but this is actually having additional data to support what one is doing in the operating room. And to me, that was the real goal of its and use. And here, just to pause on that, I mean, I know that the, um, it, it's the equivalent of looking at uh, kind of a eight feet away and 25 inch deep screen. So, you know, I think a lot of people sitting here are like, oh my gosh, do I really want my surgeon like wearing something given that they're doing a very precise surgery? How was that feel for you to be able to actually split your vision between the two? Right. You know, I think one of the metaphors for me that really made it um, easiest to express to others is it's a little bit like the rear view mirror that you may have when you're driving your car. If you think about that rear view mirror, you're essentially it's not there until you turn your attention to the rear view mirror and then it's all that you see. And this ability to sort of cognitively switch, if you will, to sort of a main image of the patient and then look for a specific data that you wish to interact with was actually very natural, surprisingly less disruptive than, what I've, than I would have anticipated. Um, any other use cases from the surgical perspective that you just want to touch on before we move to the ambulatory side? So I think, as I said, I think the, the, the main advantages from my perspective are to have, if you will, sort of an internal anatomic view of the patient as I'm actually working on the patient in real, in real time. And in addition to that, I think is actually having data that supports me as well. We were working a bit with our anesthesiologist to arrange a setting in which they can actually see the data from the monitors while they're doing other things in the room. Mm -hmm. So it actually will free them up, give them the ability to turn to the data uh, while they're working under drapes or working on other, on other equipment in the operating theater. Yeah, and I mean, we've talked about this on the phone, and there's plenty of people. How many people have operated in this room? How many people are docs that have, you know, raise your, I see a hand over here. 
I know Amanda's floating around somewhere. Yeah, so I, I think the other major use case that gets talked about all the time, at least you know, on Sand Hill Road, is teaching, right? I mean, the fact that you can actually really do some amazing stuff around a real-time surgical recording, teaching, um, you know, it brings, it brings that, it elevates that to a whole new level. So let's actually move to the ambulatory side, because I think, you know, many of us are in the world, uh, any of us who have actually worked in EHRs, who have actually invested in EHRs, um, many of us know that it, it is really about billing and documentation, right? It's not about workflow, it's not about a social relationship or enhancing the trust relationship with the patient. Uh, we're dealing with systems that are legacy systems that were built in the, in the, in, in the mid to late 70s that were all about billing. So how do we get from there to this experience where you actually can expedite a lot of that documentation, but you can really turn it into an entirely different experience? I mean, broadly, I, I see just mind-boggling application in the clinic and outpatient and ambulatory for not just the doctors, but all of the staff and the nurses, the whole value chain. Um, I mean, one broad category at one opportunity is just team communications, workflow management alerts, and there's a ton of opportunity there. And there's also a ton of opportunity in just this documentation, EHR, push-pull interaction. Um, by our measures, on average, doctors spend a quarter of their day or more feeding the beast. You have a fully loaded half million dollar co cost person spending a quarter of their day doing coding, um, reimbursement, um, that note taking. That's not why they went to medical school and that's not a good use of time. So we think glass, not just the screen, but the microphones, the camera can enable a lot of services and software that can dramatically cut down on that. That's what we're particularly focused on, um, reducing that burden, rehumanizing care. Yeah, and I, I just, I'll pop up back over to you, Pierre. Um, you know, a, a lot of, a, there's still a lot of fear, and I think we see this on the ambulatory side a lot more, um, that you know somehow technology is going to be dehumanizing uh, the patient and doctor experience. I mean, I think that like this is vocera on steroids as far as clinical messaging goes. I mean, imagine that you could just, you know, you might see people doing this a lot or doing this a lot, which is, you know, if you date in Mountain View, that's what they do anyways. Um, <laughs> so, just to bring that theme back. Also true. Um, and if your doctor's doing it, but he's explaining it, which many of them do when they use an EHR, they'll roll over to their station and say, I'm just typing some notes, right? The good docs and the good MAs, at least. So what's your take on that? I mean, is that going to be a difficult transition if, if, if docs and MAs and PAs or even, even receptionists are wearing these kinds of devices? Yeah, the brief answer is that I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that we actually have quite a fair amount of technological um, interference, if you will, to that sort of robust interaction between doctor and patient. And it is a concern at present. And I think what you talked about in terms of going back and forth between the electronic medical record is a very serious issue. From my perspective, a lot of the time that I'd like to spend actually with hands on the patient, examining a patient, interacting with a patient is interfered by this sort of back and forth movement between a desktop that often isn't even oriented in the direction of the patient. So the idea of being able to capture some of those items while actually being able to face the patient, I think generally is positive. How the patients will respond to the possibility of someone filming them or something of that sort, but they'll have to, of course, have the same trust that their privacy is not being violated will be a key to its use. I have some data points on that matter. So we've actually had hundreds of doctor-patient interactions with our doctors wearing glass. And we, as long as we empower the patient, inform them up front of what's happening, tell them your doctor is doing this, here's why, here's what's in it for you. Um, if, there, if you have any concern, he can either disable the camera or remove glass. Um, out of 200 patients from one, in one study at three different sites, there are only three adverse events where glass had to be removed for one reason or another. So we're really confident that this will, in fact, be accepted even in an outpatient clinic setting. Yeah, I mean, I, if you guys ever look at your, your arbitration forms and your HIPAA rights and everything that you sign on the way in and that your data will be shared for billing and medical reasons, I can imagine a new form uh, that you just sign on onboarding that says, you know, your, your, your clinician or your care team is going to be wearing a wearable device and uh, we're collecting very similar data as we would it actually on the EHR please sign your consent here. And if you have any issues, we're happy to actually you know, dislodge the device. So that's, that's sort of the world maybe 10 years from now, but that's what I would hope for. Um, let's move to consumer. Uh, I mean, we've seen a, a wonderful amount of, um, of, of apps and, and devices up here, you know, wearables. And I think that if you think about the extension of the Google Glass platform or ways in which you know, many of the popular uh, activity trackers that are out there today can actually interact with Glass, you start thinking about a whole new world of literally having your, your data as you're walking, right? 
or as you're eating, <laughs> which would be even more interesting. So Ian, what's your take on that? Sure, well, it's specifically our thesis is that glass will catch first in enterprise and in healthcare in particular, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. But don't get me wrong, I think this is coming to consumer and there are some amazing applications, uh, especially when the installed base comes online. I think this is gonna be a great investment opportunity. I'm seeing lots of fitness and wellness related app ideas from various entrepreneurs. Imagine running around Golden Gate Park and racing yourself yesterday and seeing the ghost of you before ahead of you or behind you. Uh, imagine um, sort of nudges and alerts in constellation with the other sensors on your body, your Fitbits and all those other devices. I think all of these work in constellation with each other and that's what you're gonna start seeing in the consumer world. Pierre? You know, and I sort of to blend this idea of consumer and healthcare in, in my mind is I like the idea of seeing our patients themselves empowered by the use of the Google Glass, which is to suggest that for example, a friend of mine, she may even be in the crowd here, Elise Singer has founded a company called uh, Share the Visit, and the idea is basically to allow the patient to communicate with other family members and be able to show what's happening in real time during that visit with a clinician. And so the idea to use a head-mounted display and a camera to be able to communicate with other family members or potentially other referring physicians to me is very empowering. So I could imagine in my mind where the patients themselves would be empowered by the technology. Yeah, the whole third party visit, I mean, you know, any of you that know share the visit and you know, Ronnie was involved as an advisor in that too. It's 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 something that I would jump on right away given it given that I'm a caregiver. Um, so let's actually move to some of the cynics in the audience. Um, so raise your hand if you think privacy is a huge issue in healthcare for these. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's HIPAA, 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 right? We've got all kinds of issues, and now we can actually collect a lot more data here. So that's the obvious one, patient consent, privacy. Um, you know, more documentation is usually better for malpractice. Um, so, I mean, wh wh what are your guys' thoughts? I mean, what are the blaring big issues for developers that are actually moving into healthcare on the Glass platform? For sure. For, first of all, I'd like to say this isn't all that different from other technologies. For example, a smartphone with a camera or a person staring into uh, telemedicine equipment or a tablet engaging in an e-consult, it's, it's not all that different. Um, but I, I think it's really all about full disclosure, informing the patient what's going on, why, giving them the power to opt in and opt out in granular ways. And uh, in addition, just actually on the on being HIPAA secure and compliant when it comes to um, the data itself and, and just getting up ahead of that as well. Yeah, but to be honest, I mean, look, we're still dealing with that on the, on, the, on the M Health side. I mean, we're still waiting for, you know, HHS and FDA and all of the guidelines to come out. Uh, that's a little bit of a morass still. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't think it's totally akin to smartphones because we haven't even gotten uh, real clear about containers and apps on smartphones. So this is like a whole new level of where, where data is being collected in real time. I mean, Pierre, how do you feel? I might be sort of a little bit of a Debbie Downer here, but... You know, I, I don't have much that, except of course, you know, you need to separate the ideas of security and privacy, and I'm, I'm not an expert to speak about security specifically. But with respect to privacy, I, I tend to agree with Ian, it's largely a matter of a full disclosure to the patient as to the nature of the use of the data. So that patient is essentially, effectively a collaborator with you in that sharing of the data, which I think is an, uh, sort of a critical issue. And at some levels, at least as far as privacy, not the technical um, requirements of security, but as, at least as far as privacy goes, we actually quite commonly do ask our patients to share, to allow us to share data. I give talks around the country, and when I do those, give those talks, I give slides all the time with some kind of de-identified uh, uh, private health data. And to be able to give that protected health information really is a matter of simply having our patients essentially partner with us to allow us to share that data. And I think that's well within the, ram the realm of what we do but probably for the last 20 years in medicine. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this. I mean, how many, how many people in the audience would feel, like, I, I know a lot of physicians that don't even want me to record them on a mini recorder or on my phone in an audio file. I mean, I, I, I see, you know, many, many doctors with a sick mom, and they're all very, very funky about that, or they don't like it when I need to put them on speakerphone for a cell phone for another family member that just wants to listen in on mute. They, they tend to have, at least on the ambulatory side, they tend to have a lot of fear around recording, uh, because they, they think that they're in such a litigious society that that's gonna come back and bite them. So I'm just curious, I mean, anybody wanna just jump up and blurt out, like, is that a concern? Anybody in the audience that, you know, if you're a physician that you would have being recorded? It's the opposite. It's the opposite. You, were the, you were like, the, weren't you the, the government dude earlier? <laughs> weren't, weren't you the one that asked the question yesterday about like what's happening with all the government recording stuff? Oh, you just look like him. 
Okay. <laughs> This, this is San Francisco, after all. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, Esther, where are you? What do you think? You think physicians would actually not feel they they would feel like more data is better, or? I think a lot of them are like policemen. They want to arrest you if you say things, but the modern ones are cool with it because they're the ones who went out with you last night. Oh, I wish that was the one that went out with me last night. <laughs> well, just a, just a, one of the things that we. I would like to do with my patients is a lot of things I tell them about, you know, a stage 3A lung cancer and whether they have chemotherapy or surgery or radiotherapy are fairly complicated. So what I like to do is actually in some way to memorialize what happens in that clinic oh, that's room a great, because otherwise great point. I get all kinds of random questions and concerns and misunderstandings between them and as they explain it to others. So what do I do in the clinic right now? Well, I actually have a long piece of paper and I make this almost life-size drawing of the patient and rip it off and give it to the patient oh, so wow. they can take it with them. Well, yeah, that's a fairly primitive approach. There are companies out there, GIF.com was very active in this space, which really are working to try to memorialize what, ha what happens in the uh, clinic. And I think that the Google Glass technology could really apply there. And not just for that's you, really but point. for the patient also. There, there must be transparency for everyone. And I think that's, as long as there's something in it for the patient as well that's significant, that's what's gonna get the buy-in for all of this technology. So talk to us a little bit about how you positioned Augmetis. You clearly are part of the Explorer program. How did you get involved with that? Tell us a little bit more about Augmetics, and then I want to close with some VC questions specifically and a call to action, and we'll go to questions. Sure, sure thing. So Augmetics' position is um, we, we love Google Glass. It's frankly the best hardware out there, but truth be told, we are hardware agnostic. Um, on that question now, I mean, what are we all about? Where are we as a company? I mean, it, it is, in fact... It's reclaiming that 25% of that time the doctor spends on the computer, um, allowing that to be repurposed and spent on care that matters, humane care. And what we're essentially doing is offering the doctor a suite of services and, and software mediated through Google Glass to make that possible. Um, yeah, so uh, we as a company, we're, the, we're one of the first glass startups. Um, we've got about 10 folks here in the U.S. and a software development team overseas. And four pilot sites up and running and a lot of happy doctors and some big announcements are coming soon about even bigger partnerships. So stay tuned for more soon. Great, okay, one last question before we throw it out to the audience. What do we think would be, a, what are VCs looking for? I mean, I can tell you from the standard sort of, uh, you know, VC 101 book, you know, when you're, when you're an app developer on a new platform, you wanna know what's the monetization strategy, is the market big enough, is it niche, is it not niche? So, you know, just given that you are in this space and you are, Clearly, a startup that will be fundraising, um, and Pierre, you know, you're 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 potentially representing the buyer side and the user side. So, what is an ideal app on the Glass platform using Glass device that would have huge market share that I would, you know, my firm, not me personally, but my firm would want to write a check for? I, I think it's a time-based answer. In the near term, we need to look for huge ideas with big value propositions. There are a lot of little micro sexy ideas where doctor, doctors say, yeah, I like that, that's really cool, but does it offer enough value for me to buy this, the behavior change, ask my CIO? So we gotta go for huge things. And then once we have an installed base and you have those huge apps, then you can add in the little things. So I see a lot of little niche micro apps. You, you, you should f focus away from those right now. And the other thing I would say is, look, how well could your app idea or the app you might invest in be done on a on a smartphone or on a big screen TV or on that robot telemedicine equipment over there, if it's 80% as good over there, it's probably not worth doing that on glass right now. So look for things that are enabled by glass. All right, we're getting the hook from Hallie. So we need one question and it's gotta be good. It can't be a bad question. If your question sucks, your I'm question, not calling on you. <laughs> All right, Are you, you really believe oh. strongly that your question's good? Okay. Oh, well, it's from Can, Leah. It's, we'll is, it, is it okay? Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, you know, we talked about skepticism around privacy and whatnot. I'm skeptical, a little bit skeptical about adoption. How long will it take for this to get to Oklahoma? Yeah, question. and this is $1,500 right now is the, is, the, is the thematic price point. I mean, I think there's rumors that Google's going to launch Be Ready by early 2014, but, I mean, come on, $1,500? Like, my mom would never, never go there, right? <laughs> So, so we're not waiting around for doctors to buy glass and say, hey, please install our app. I mean, we're offering a service. Included in that service is the hardware. And I think that's the way all the early business models have to be. 